Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to MRI Climate Talks. My name is Eri Saikawa, and I'm an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences at Emory University. This year, 2020, is truly special. First is COVID, second is the US presidential election, and the third is the abundant extreme events. So many parts of the US and Mexico were all hit badly by the tropical storm Zeta. Two million people lost power and many are still not having access back. We are seeing an abnormal, abnormally active hurricane season, but the extreme of 2020 is also visible in the Arctic sea ice. The sea ice has not frozen yet, and this is the latest date on record. Through today's workshop, I hope we can come up with some great solutions for these um, extreme events that are taking place. MRI Climate Talks webinar series is made possible by our anonymous donor that supports our trip to the United Nations climate change negotiations. And MRI Climate Talks is in partnership with the Department of Environmental Sciences and the Resilience and Sustainability Collaboratory at Emory University. Before I introduce our speakers today, uh, I wanted to talk about some logistics. We have had great talks in the past seven months and many of them are on a YouTube channel. Please check it out and subscribe at youtube.com slash C slash MRI Climate Talks. I would also like to thank Leah Thomas for doing all the work behind the scenes, even though she is not able to join us because she does not have power right now. Also, please subscribe to our newsletter so that you will receive all the upcoming talk information directly to your mailbox. We will have a talk next Friday at noon EDT on energy insecurity with Professor Sanya Kali at Indiana University Bloomington. And we will invite the father of environmental justice, Dr. Robert Bullard on December 1st at noon EDT. A lot of great events are coming up and I hope you will be able to join us. So today, uh, four of the Emory students, Jack McLosick, Sydney Warner, Erica Khan, and Ari Kaufman, who are Emory undergraduate students in my class and members of Emory Climate Analysis and Solutions team, known as ECAST, will be leading uh, the event. We have speakers from the Partnerships for Southern Equity to learn more about the important work the organization is doing on energy equity. I'm so excited uh, that I am able to partner with those students and I hope you will enjoy uh, today's event. Now, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Jack, Sydney, Erica, and Ari to kick off today's event. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Sakawa, and thank you everybody for coming. Uh, I just want to quickly introduce uh, ECAST, uh, which like Dr. Sakawa said, is the Emory Climate Analysis and Solutions team. Um, ECAST provides a forum for undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty across Emory to uh, conduct climate-related analyses, advance climate solutions, and try to increase our capacity for climate action. And we hope that today's event gives you, um, you know, some great skills that you can use when you're trying to think about um, environmental issues and some policy solutions for those. Um, so thanks so much for coming again, and I'm going to pass it over to Sydney, who can introduce our wonderful speakers. Everyone. I'm Sydney Warner, once again, part of the research group that's hosting this event. And we are excited to welcome Partnership for Southern Equity, otherwise known as PSC, which is an organization dedicated to bringing empowerment to underserved groups in the areas of energy equity, economic inclusion, equitable, de equitable development, and health equity. Their mission is to advance policies and institutional actions that promote racial equity and shared prosperity for all in the growth of metropolitan Atlanta and the American South. Today, we are joined by Michael Beck Miller, the student and youth organizer, organizer at PSC, and Alicia Scott, the manager of the Just Energy Project founded by PSC. I leave the floor to you both now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you guys both. Thank you for having us here um, at this event. Um, this is uh, a contact that was led by our organizer, Michael McMiller. I'm gonna um, pass it over to him, but thank you again. Um, for having us, and he's going to kick us off. Hello, everyone. Uh, like everyone has said, I'm Michael McMiller. I'm the student and youth organizer on the Just Energy team at PSC. Uh, we appreciate you for allowing us to come. Uh, we have done some work with Emory in the past and, and many other universities around uh, Atlanta, so it's always good to be around youth leaders. Uh, I'm Michael McMiller. And Alicia Scott is our Just Energy Manager, and let's get started. Uh, so 
I think it's important for the context of this conversation to know that Nathaniel Smith, our CEO and founder, uh, grew up in an environment where he, uh, his parents served uh, under Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in his efforts to fight for Black people in the South. And so he always has a good quote for us and he always has some good stories to tell us about what it was like sitting up under the table as a, as a, as a young child. Uh, getting to absorb some of the energy from some of the black leaders that came to Atlanta back in the days. Um, and this quote is one that he says often is, is, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And I think that's really, really important context for the notion of sustainability and the, and the notion of uh, this one world that we have all living together. I think people sometimes feel that when people talk about the environment, that we're somehow helping the earth when they don't really, really understand that we're helping human existence on earth, that the earth will be just fine without us just existing for millions of years. Uh, it's humans that are a threat. And so we have to do everything in our power to ensure that we have a, a good life and a healthy life for a long time on this earth. Um, as it was previously stated, our mission is the Partnership for Southern Equity advances policies and institutional actions to promote racial equity and shared prosperity for all uh, in the metropolitan Atlanta area and also the American South. So we do a work across the Southeast in the eight states in the Delta region. Uh, we do this through the Just Energy portfolio, which uh, Alicia and I are part of, the Just Growth portfolio which is mostly focused on city planning and transit, the Just Opportunity Portfolio, which is about uh, economic inclusion and jobs and workforce development and things of that nature. And then our youngest portfolio, which is just health. Um, and it's all about equity. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we want to make sure that people have a just and fair inclusion in everything that we do. Uh, like Nathaniel says all the time, like, we're not an uh, energy organization or we're not an uh, economic inclusion organization. We're a racial equity organization that happens to do work in these four areas. And, and we always lead with race. We're not uh, bashful. We're actually unapologetic about putting race at the center of everything because we know that systematic oppression has informed all of the decisions and all of the results of why we are in the position we are today. So we lead with race at all times. We catalyze relationships. It's in our name, the partnership for Southern Equity. So we know that there are many groups doing many great works across these rural and urban uh, environments across the Southeast and we need everybody. So it's really important for us not to be the big eye but instead to be the facilitator of these relationships where people wouldn't normally talk. Um, to build an equity ecosystem is kind of the walking of the talking and, and saying that once we start to find multiple organizations that believe in equity, it, uh, such as we do across the Southeast, that we all come together under these initiatives or in these circles and make sure that everybody knows each other and that we're, we're feeding each other the best we can. Sometimes we have pass through grants that we give to people. And sometimes we're the, on the receiving end of those things. And sometimes we send our very talented youth over to their organizations and vice versa. So we just try to make sure that uh, we're in a state of harmony with everybody that we work with across the board. We're grounded by black people and people of color. There is uh, this notion that by somehow uh, helping everybody else will ultimately trickle down and help Black people, but Black people have never been the center of the conversation, and they, pe people have never explicitly talked about Black people when it comes to lifting them up, and we're the people that are bringing that conversation uh, to uh, everywhere, actually, everywhere that we're involved in. We specifically talk about Black people. Our organization is made up of primarily Black people, and we, we really, really, really are intentional about that. Uh, because sometimes we use generic terminology, like people always seem to get left out. Um, and finally, we leverage data and research. So um, Nathaniel always says, people have the right to alternative opinions, but not to alternative facts. So when we come to a room and to a space, we give you the data. 
we give you the hard facts that shows the difference in, uh, between what happens in black communities and brown communities versus what happens in white communities or Asian communities. So that we're not um, trying to lead an emotional charge. This is very much factual and scientific in nature. Uh, like I said before, we talked about the equity ecosystem. Uh, hold on, I think we have a question. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. Um, strengthening community power and engagement. So we do this, the, this grassroots organizing, this values-based organizing through authentic community engagement, community organizing, leadership development, research and reporting, and coalition building. Um, I think a lot of that is, is self-exclamatory in a way. Um, authentic community engagement basically means that we don't go into community unless we're asked to be in community. We don't go into community for photo ops. We don't go into community unless we have something to offer. If we're not adding value, we don't show up. Uh, community organizing, the largest portion of our makeup of an organization is our organizing unit. It's about seven of us strategically placed across the state. We have Central Georgia, so deep Southern Valdosta, Georgia. We have uh, Central Georgia with uh, Fort Valley, uh, Northern Georgia. And then you have about three or four uh, of organizers in Atlanta specifically to make sure that our face is in the place and that we're not just showing up when the cameras come out, but that we're there doing the work uh, on a consistent basis all throughout the year. Leadership development. Um, we have several youth initiatives and we have several academies across our portfolios where we spend an extensive amount of time. Most of our academies last seven to nine months uh, where we talk about the context of what it means to do this work uh, and what it means to be really informed in the values that this community has uh, so that you don't go in pre prescribing something and you know nothing about what their problems are. So we do a really, really good job with that. Uh, talk about research and reporting and then also coalition building because we have circles in each one of our portfolios. So outside the, the nucleus of the organizational structure that we have, three or four people in the organization, we have the circle members, which are, uh, I don't know, 15 to 20 different organizations that focus on an aspect of the same work that we do. Uh, and we all sit down maybe twice a week. I mean, well, once every two weeks, I apologize. And, and we talk about the collective issues like the integrated resource plan or when Plant Vogel uh, was up for discussion a couple of years ago and many, many things like that that we'll get into in a minute. Um, Here's some data. Uh, this actually comes from, uh, I don't have where it comes from at the moment. Sorry, <laughs> but the tales of two cities, black people represent at least 80% of the population in the 12 of the 17 MPUs located along I-20 or below I-20, while more than 60% of the Northern MPU populations are white. So. On one hand, they say segregation is no longer in existence and that it was abolished a while back, but yet and still, in many different other ways, you can see how segregation still exists uh, and what underlying trends go along with this. This was actually voting data, I'm sorry. This was from the last election uh, and who voted for uh, uh, the incumbent and uh, Keisha, Lamb Keisha Lance Bottoms. Uh, and that blue, that deep sea of blue below I-20 is all the, the African-American population, black people majority, and then the green is uh, people uh, who are Caucasian or considered white uh, in the circumstances. Over 90% of all the job centers are found north of I-20. So when we talk about economic inclusion and workforce development, it's no wonder why some of these trends prevail. So a few years ago, uh, we were having a conversation in a community and we just asked people outright, um, uh, are energy decisions made with marginalized communities in mind? And resounding at least 71% of people understood that it's not, that the Public Service Commission and, and these large municipalities um, do not take us into consideration when they make decisions. This picture is actually from a line 
uh, of people who are standing outside for vouchers for um, energy assistance, uh, bill pay assistance. Uh, and 90% of the vouchers were already done by the time uh, these people were still standing in line. And it's just, it's just not enough to cover the fact that our system is broken in many different ways. So we keep talking about race and we keep talking about equity and we keep talking about energy and how do all these three things intersect. Uh, ACEEE is a, a professional organization that's been around about 30 years and they produce a report every year. Uh, and they have shown most recently that the median energy burden of low income households in Atlanta is 3.6 times higher than that of a uh, non low income household anywhere else. The medium energy burden of a low income multifamily household in Atlanta is 2.6 times higher than that of a multifamily household anywhere else. And 33%, so the, the median energy burden of black households in Atlanta is 33% higher than that of a non-Hispanic white household. And also uh, the zip codes that we talked about early in this presentation uh, in Southern Atlanta below I-20 has the fourth highest uh, energy burden average in the country. Um, and I think I'll pass it on to Alicia from there. Uh, thank you, Michael. That was, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, I learned something every time I see this presentation. I learned something more um, today. So what is energy? So just energy is a frame to advance energy equity. And when I say just energy, um, it took me a couple of years working in ancillary organizations with the Partnership for Southern Equity to understand what just energy means. Just energy doesn't mean just as in only, it, it means just, fair, and equitable. So just energy equity, it's the fair distribution of benefits and burdens of our energy production and consumption, meaning that the, the lower end of our, of our you know, society is bearing an unfair and disproportionate burden of our energy consumption. Um, and that has to do with a lot of things. Um, our, you know, outdated architecture, um, which is usually a result of the inequities in racial economic development and infrastructure development within cities. Um, next slide, please. Uh oh, did I, did I, there we go. <laughs> All right. Okay, <laughs> just energy is the frame to advance energy, ex um, um, energy equity. We work with Black people. We are primarily first a racial equity organization and we, we constantly recalibrate and center ourselves, as Michael said, back to that, back to that core focus of our work. Um, we work with black people in marginalized communities to understand the sourcing and commodification um, of power generation. And then we take, um, we take action in support of an equity centered energy, utility and climate policies. So what is, our, what, is our, what is the action that we take? You can go to the next slide. Um, we do that through multiple programs. So I'm here to talk specifically about the Just Energy program. I am the Just Energy portfolio manager. And we have four primary um, programs that we, that we work with to, to advance our energy policy. The, the main one is our Just Energy Circle. That is our coalition of energy and climate justice partners. We get together, we work, we hash out with some of our local and regional issues with energy equity and environmental justice are. And then we come up with solutions and build out campaigns to either influence the decision makers or the elected policy makers. So that is our just energy circle. Um, and it is, we rotate board members in and out on an annual basis. We have different committees within our circles. Um, we have different levels of, of, the of, of society working in our circles. We have everyone from Big Green. Big Green meaning you know, the big solar companies, been big wind companies, big green contractors, to small grassroots neighborhood associations, organizations. Um, we have members who work with uh, the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, as well as Georgia One. Um, and we partner all across the nation within, within the Just Energy Circle Coalition. Um, keep that same energy. That is the program that Michael McMiller heads up. It is our student and youth engagement. It's a way to bridge 
the gap between generations. Um, as many of you um, may know, um, are you know the professor as well as the students. We've got a whole generation in American society that was skipped. I like to call it Generation X. We sort of went from baby boomers and we've skipped all the way over an entire generation. We didn't do a very good job of, of building up future political leaders. And this is as a country as a whole. So one of the things partnership with Southern Equity has started to do was bridge those gaps so that we can start grooming the next generation of leaders in this work. And that is what Keep That Same Energy is. It all culminates in obviously a big, a big summit uh, biannually every two years, but we also have the Just Energy Academy. And I'm gonna post that, we're gonna put that, the, um, the application link to the Just Energy Academy in the chat. But our Just Energy Academy is our eight month, uh, seven month, I call it eight months because it feels like it's eight months planning it. Um, it's a seven month leadership training and development program where we are training um, community leaders, students, academics, executives, anybody who wants to be a part of this work and be effective. Um, we're training them and developing them to build out coalitions, advance campaigns, get deeper connected with energy, racial equity, um, and environmental justice issues. So applications for our Just Energy Academy for, 20, for the 2021 cohort just opened and you all are invited to apply. It is a fully funded leadership program. So we just want, you know, give us your best, apply and, and we try to make a very diverse cohort with each group that comes through. So we've graduated um, two years worth of classes thus far. It, it, we launched it in 2019 and um, we had our first class then and we had our second class traveling around the state as we normally do. Um, but we're hoping that that changes for 2021. So we do invite, uh, we invite you professor as well as all of the, uh, the students in the class to apply for the Just Energy Academy. We would love to see, um, see some of your shining faces. And then every two years we get together with um, racial equity, environmental justice, energy equity, um, climate justice, Anyone in this space, in the ecosystem for equity, we, we host a Just Energy Summit and we host that every two years. So we just finished our, 20, our 2020 Just Energy Summit um, and we're happy to share that link with you um, and the class so that you guys can go and take a look because it's out, it's out there in the ether and so all of our sessions and breakout sessions um, are out there, but it brings together leaders in this work all across the Southeast. Actually, we had people all the way from California doing the same sort of racial equity, workforce development and clean energy work. We had people culminate from all over the nation to share ideas, share their conferences, um, share their resources, um, share information, share articles, everything from you know looking for organizers and people who wanna work um, in this space, looking for employees for their organizations, but it is a wonderful summit. We get together and we talk about everything from the policy that's affecting communities of color um, to voter suppression, to you know, dry weather, you know, uh, flood events, things like that. So it was just a it's a wonderful summit. We you know we highly encourage any students wanting to work in the environmental justice. Um, or climate work to to take a look, uh, be on the lookout for the next Just Energy Summit in, I think we're in 2022 now, or tw yeah, 2022. Um, and so those are the four areas that we organize around with, with PSC. Okay, next slide. I think I've eaten up all my time on that one slide. Okay, so what is, what is, what is the actual work? What is our action? What is the actionable step that we take? Um, we are, we're, you know, we, we inspire, we try to inspire and keep, have, help people working in this space, you know, keep their head, heads up. We're also values driven, you know, we have a core set of values that we operate from, um, and we believe in collaboration. Um, like Michael said, it's not about photo ops and going into the community. And let me know when I get close to my time, because, you know, I can just talk. <laughs> but, um, um, so we go into uh, communities to help communities build power. Our goal is to help develop 
um, future leaders and then give those future leaders um, circles of power to work within and to build coalitions. Um, we encourage communities um, to participate in this and we try to educate. The big th one of the big things we do is try to educate the communities um, on the policy that, in fact, that affects um, what they pay for energy. Again, our one of our primary focuses within the Just Energy Circle is um, the equitable distribution of energy burdens across all demographics. So we our, our goal is to help communities build power so that you know they can stand up against uh, policies that negatively affect them. Okay, next slide. Okay, here, this is a list of our shared values and vision. Um, we try to make sure that we keep our work, our work people-centered. A lot of times we can get caught up in, you know, in the built environment, we can get caught up in the policies, but we wanna make sure that the communities um, are holding the power. So one of our shared values is we get to know each other. We take the time to do check-ins with one another and really care about those who are working, uh, doing this work with us and on our coalition. Um, we the center of importance of values is within the context of our policy systems transformation. Um, we center all of our policy, all any of the policy that we are going after to influence. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of the campaigns that we launched this year um, came after the COVID lockdowns. And it was just ahead of a decision that the Georgia Public Service Commission was going to make where they were going to start, you know, resume shutoffs right in the middle of COVID, you know, after all, you know, historic unemployment. Um, and they were, it was within their power to, to you know, to, to halt shutting off electricity. Now, everybody knows now in this, you know, modern day, we all need this. We all need cell phones to communicate. We live on these things. Um, and we were sent home to work remotely. Um, how can we, you know, how can people find jobs, file unemployment? How can they function if you turn their electricity off? Um, and this was something that disproportionately affects communities of color. However, in this instance, this is something that would, would benefit everybody because, um, you know, the, 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 shut, the lockdown affected every demographic. Um, we grow the ecosystem of practice. We are coalition and relationship builders. That's why we have the Just Energy Circle. The Just Energy Circle is designed for our current members and our current member organizations who sit on our, on our circles to invite new and lateral industry um, partners who wanna help us in this work. So we work to grow our ecosystem of practice. Um, it's a safe place to discuss um, historic and cultural context. We make it um, very comfortable to discuss hard conversations. The racial equity conversation can be very hard in multiple rooms, not just rooms that are not predominantly people of color, but in rooms of predominantly people of color. We don't, we don't want to talk about, you know, how poorly the black side of town was done. Um, okay, five minutes, perfect. All right, next slide, please. And then we, you know, we help design framework and share best practice. Okay, keep going. Okay, fancy. Okay, um, so basically, you, this is fine. You can start here. You can stop here. So um, our objectives are we're prioritizing our partnerships with community-based organizations. Um, that's part of the reason we are here presenting at Emory. We are um, trying to increase our our partnerships and our stu student and youth um, organizer Michael McMiller is doing a great job bringing um, academia in the area into this conversation and into this work. Um, we also uh, work on developing institutional actions that advance just and equitable renewable energy policy. Some of the work we're working on now, as um, Michael explained earlier, is workforce development in the renewable energy sector. Um, and elevate the importance and pathways to community ownership of renewable energy systems. We do a lot of work around EMCs, which are, um, I think they're energy member-led cooperatives. I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, I get this acronym wrong every time, but the, the, the EMCs where the community owns their, their power distribution is another area of focus that we're moving in. And we're trying very, we, you know, we've got a lot of campaigns around 
um, learning about EMCs and how to and why you need to vote in them. I think a lot of us, if you live, um, I live in East Point. So if you live in East Point, you, um, we have a municipal led um, electric cooperative who provide our, our electricity over here. So you should check out EMCs when you get a chance. And do we have one more slide and then I'll wrap us up. Um, so here's our activities, and then I'll close out right here on this slide. Um, Public Service Commission intervention. Um, we put pressure on the Public Service Commission this past summer with our We the Plug campaign, which was a social media, a viral social media campaign that was, it was that did a great job in exposing um, and educating the population on who the Public Service Commissioners are and what policies they are in control of when it comes to your energy and your utility bills. Um, democratizing rural electric cooperatives. We are trying to get more communities in rural Georgia. Um, we work in middle Georgia, which is Macon, Fort Valley, all the way down through Savannah, Chatham County, as well as Glenn County in the coastal Georgia communities. There are lots of cooperatives outside of the Atlanta MSA and members in these rural areas, uh, they don't know that they have a right to help make decisions in their EMCs. Um, and no shutoffs. Uh, it's a team federal advocacy. We're working with coalitions all across the nation to compel states to put in a no shutoff policy in the age of COVID-19. These are our three uh, major activities going on right now at Just Energy. And that about does it. And we'll open it up for, for questions now. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We're actually going to hold off on, on questions for a little. Um, our hope is that you all were able to see the inner workings of a local organization's contributions to the community while also learning a little bit about the policy process and what it really takes to get things done. Their work has allowed issues of underserved communities to be represented on a large scale and has brought attention to pressing issues throughout the region. If you have any questions, please feel free to just put it in the chat and speakers feel free to respond in the chat as well as we shift gears in this half of the presentation. So our research group is currently working to raise awareness about energy injustices in a couple of case studies, one of them being the Dakota Access Pipeline or DAPL. For our part of this presentation, we'd like to share some background info on DAPL and its effect on Native American communities in pre preparation to create your own policy proposal based off the information we've provided. So I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about background information about DAPL and then we're gonna send a link um, to a Google presentation that you guys can all um, hopefully get to once we send it in the chat. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see it? Awesome. All right, so the Dakota Access Pipeline is an underground oil pipeline 1,172 miles long, approved by Energy Transfer Partners in 2014 and the US Army Corps of Engineers. Part of the pipeline was approved to be built within half a mile of the native Standing Rock Sioux tribe without consultation from them, violating Article 2 of the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, which guarantees undisturbed use and occupation of reservation lands. Not only does the permittance of the pipeline violate the Sioux tribe's sovereignty over the disputed land, the pipeline raises environmental and health concerns and threatens sacred sites. At first, and you can see in the photos, the pipeline was supposed to cross the Missouri River near Bismarck, but it was moved over concerns over an oil spill that would contaminate the state's capital drinking water. So it was moved to cross Lake Oahe on the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Dakota Access LLC claims the pipeline is the safest and most efficient way to transport crude oil and is a safer alternative to truck or rail. The pipeline would increase energy security and create 8,000 and 12,000 jobs. And I'm gonna um, pass it the next slide on to Ari. Right, so, that, so the change, the proposed change that brings the pipeline closer to the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation uh, prompts protests worldwide and brings together environmental activists and social justice warriors 
and they were met with some police brutality. Uh, the Obama administration originally denied the permit that was needed to cross the, the river to complete the pipeline. However, the Trump administration reversed that decision and slashed other environmental protection regulations to speed up the process. In March 2020, the Army Corps of Engineers was found to have violated the National Environmental Policy Act. And doing so, they glossed over the potential consequences, consequences of an oil spill. So as of July 6, 2020, a judge ruled that all Dakota Access pipeline operations must halt as the government conducts a full-fledged analysis revolving the risks that the pipeline poses to the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. The shutdown will last until the environmental review is complete, which will likely take a few years. So it will be up to the next, the new administration to make final permitting decisions. Awesome. So now we're just going to send in the chat. Um, I'm going to stop sharing um, the link to the Google Drive, which ha has instructions on what to do. If um, I think if Sydney or Jack wants to take over. Okay. Um, I can share my screen on the presentation now. So now we have the instructions for the activity itself. We're gonna give you guys about 15 minutes and breakout rooms, we're gonna separate two into groups of four. And uh, I just sent the link in the chat to um, access the Google Slides presentation that we've just had for you guys, where you'll rewrite your proposal using the policy guidelines that we're about to explain. And the activity itself is creating a policy proposal that will address an issue relating to that poll. So consider things like energy accessibility, water pollution, land rights, and things along those lines. And then after those 15 minutes, we're going to regroup and hopefully discuss a couple of the proposals that were created by you guys. And so just make sure that there's somebody in each group that's delegated to speak. Okay, so here's part one of our policy proposal guidelines that we've created to hopefully help you guys be able to form um, a, a thorough policy. So for the first thing you need to consider is your problem statement. And this is consists of like a brief background or reasoning for your proposed policy. And so the, uh, why is this issue really important? And why does it even need to be? Then you wanna go into the overview of your proposed policy, which just consists of a very short summary and thinking about the major points that you wanna hit. And so I kind of equate this to a thesis statement of a paper. So just try and make it as um, encompassing as possible as you can since we're in such a short amount of time. And then for the second part of our policy proposal guidelines, you wanna think about the actual solution or recommendation that you're proposing. So whatever's determined by your group, what are the actions that you plan to take? And there are four things that we'd like you to try to take into account, things like the priorities of what's most important, the potential costs, so what type of money might go into this or materials that would be needed to make this a reality? The effectiveness and how it will benefit the groups involved on both sides and then the audience and stakeholders. So who's ultimately being affected by this decision for the better or the worse? Awesome, thank you, Sydney. Um, so we're just gonna go really quickly through um, one example of something that you might do, and then we can get you all into breakout rooms. Um, so for example, you could have a problem statement that talked about um, the unknown environmental impacts from continuing pipeline construction across Lake Oahe, um, and talking about um, the dependence of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe on that reservoir for their water supply and the risks involved with the machinery and transportation of fossil fuels. And you might come to a conclusion that you should reject the easement to cross the lake um, and force a reevaluation of the current plan. And so if you, um, you know, here's just sort of an outline of what this might look like. Um, so you, you could have your problem, uh, the potential consequences and the purpose. Um, and so you can see lots of these things that we're going to try to um, think about um, when we're um, discussing. So um, unless anybody has any um, questions, um, we're going to start um, getting you all into breakout rooms and feel free to use the um, raise hand feature or the ask for help feature to um, try to, you know, get us to come um, answer any questions that you might have while you're in breakout rooms. Um, but if nobody has any questions right now, um, and feel free to speak up, I'll, I'll stop talking for a second and let you do that, then we can um, join breakout rooms. Okay, 
and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And enjoy. Thanks. Uh, I think these are people that came during the presentation, so we didn't have time to put them in actual breakout rooms beforehand. Um, the, all of you should be assigned, actually. Um, I've been watching it through the whole thing. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording also. That's cool with you guys. All right, if you want to go ahead, I think we got everybody back. Awesome. All right, guys, well, thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed our little breakout activity. I'm sorry you didn't have much time, but we were just trying to get you to think about the policy proposal process, even if your um, proposals aren't totally finished or um, thought out completely. So first, I guess, is there any group that would like to share your, um, your stated problem and then your proposal real quick? I can scroll to your group number all right i don't think we can see your pop-up we can still see like that the previous one so just make sure we can see that thanks this one i can present from here make it easier to find people no one wants to share oh it looks like group four wants to go thanks joel Hello, yes. Um, so I am speaking on behalf of group four, which was um, Olivia Milloway, Mackenzie White and I. Um, so we were um, thinking along the lines of like forming an energy or a community based energy coalition within the native community. Um, and having that as a source of um, or a possible avenue for developing a green energy independent from oil and non renewable fossil fuels to increase independence. Um, and the way that we propose to get to this um, future would be through, um, so the Dakota Access Pipeline provides um, oil to refineries that, and in no way, shape or form benefits the uh, native communities that are negatively affected by the environmental development. So we propose that through taxation of this company, um, those funds can go to um, a, com a community-based assessment and initiative um, to first understand what the community wants in regards to energy, um, and then to help work with them to create sustainable change to gear future energy initiatives towards promoting green infrastructure. Um, so through the money that was um, gained from the oil companies that were um, responsible for the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, there's an a avenue for change towards green energy in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much. That, that really works into PSC's objectives where they're trying to like prioritize partnerships with like community organizations and leaders. So that's really good. Do any other groups want to share? We don't have that much for more time, so. Well, if not, then thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And we hope that uh, you got something out of this and are at least, you know, starting to think about these um, big problems, you know, um, that we are trying to face and um, how difficult it can really be to address all of the stakeholders and all of the issues that are part of a lot of these um, different policies. Um, so thanks so much for coming and we hope you got a lot out of it and um, feel free to, you know, ask us any questions or um, get in contact if you need to. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. And feel free to scroll through the slides and see what other people wrote as well if you want. Thank you guys. Thanks everybody.